Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. This past week, we treated you to a leisurely float trip on the Green River through Desolation Canyon between Dinosaur National Monument and Canyon Lambs National Park in Utah. We also took an architectural tour of Indiana Dunes National Park and reported on the mudslides that effectively sealed off Mount Rainier National Park. You can find those and other stories about national parks and protected areas on nationalparkstraveler.org. This week's show kicks off our coverage of the Colorado River and how its health, or lack of health, impacts Canyonlands National Park and Glen Canyon National Recreation Area in Utah. We also take a peek at Grand Portage National Monument in Minnesota and what awaits intrepid park travelers who put it on their to-do list. This is a special edition of Traveler's Weekly Podcast. We've been working on a series of stories involving the Colorado River and its health, or maybe its lack of health, and how it impacts national parks in Utah. We're talking today with Patrick Cohn, a writer who went down to southern Utah to look at the situation firsthand. Pat, thanks for joining us. Oh, nice to be here. So you went down to look at Canyonlands National Park and Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, and the Colorado River, which flows through both, and how the river impacts those parks. How did you approach this series? Well, I was specifically looking at uh, changes in climate, um, their forecasts coming up warmer and drier, and how that's affecting the ecosystem and the river flows come into Lake Powell and through Cataract Canyon and Canyon Lance National Park. So I uh, approached it by, by basically trying to talk to everybody I could who had some kind of connection with those areas. I spoke with uh, boatmen who run Cataract Canyon. I talked to uh, National Park Service uh, science rangers in, uh, in Canyon Lands as well as uh, Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. And uh, old-time residents, I talked to Bureau of Reclamation people. Uh, what's going on down there right now is the water flow through there is predicted to become even less than it is now. And that's evident by the fact that Lake Powell is not nearly anywhere near the full pool it's supposed to be. And the same with Lake Mead, too. Uh, Bureau of Reclamation really has the overall authority on, on the water there. And they're, um, according to Marlon Duke, who's the public information officer at the Bureau of Reclamation, they tend to manage both those reservoirs together, Lake Mead and Lake Powell. And they're both not full right now, and they're trying to figure out how this is going to work. Uh, if the less and less water comes down the Colorado River. Now, you're going to be rolling out a series of stories on, on what you found, what your reporting led you to on the traveler in the, in the weeks ahead. Now, some people say climate change, you know, that, that takes effect over a long period of time. Were you able to get the sense that you can see what's going on on the ground now or on the river, as it were? Uh, you know, talking to the climate scientists and, and rangers, uh, it's happening right now, and they're seeing change fairly quickly. I uh, had a chance to go to Flagstaff, Arizona, and talk to uh, U.S. Geological Survey uh, um, scientist Scott Vanderkoy. Uh, they're seeing changes right now in things like the temperature of the water coming out of the Glen Canyon Dam. Um, National Park Service scientists uh, Ken Hyde and John Spence and their office in Page, seeing things happening right now. You're seeing uh, species that are that are endangered and, and moving around. You're seeing uh, die-offs in some pinion juniper forests. Um, there's there's things happening quickly. It's a it's a fast-moving issue right now. Uh, John Spence, who's uh, one of the scientists at Glen Cane National Recreation Area for the National Park Service, thought that in uh, 30 years the climate at Page, Arizona would be about the same as at Lee's Ferry, which is 1,500 feet below. So there's, we're seeing warmer and drier, and, and things, are, things are moving quickly. Uh, he said, uh, you know, it's a great time to be a scientist, but th- there's a lot going on right now, and it's, it's happening quickly, too. Now, one of the predictions with climate change is that uh, the Colorado Plateau is going to see less precipitation in the form of snow and, and more in the form of rain. It, was anybody able to tell you how that could impact the river? Oh, absolutely. I've talked to some hydrologists with the uh, 
um, the University of Colorado at Boulder Environmental Science Group. Uh, we saw this last year. We're seeing less and less snow uh, down to the 8,000 foot level in Colorado, which is obviously where the Colorado River originates. Uh, more, more in the for, uh, former range from 8,000 to 10,000 feet. Above 10,000 feet, they had some really heavy snows in Colorado in the, the winter of, of 2019, but below 10,000, a lot of rain. Of course, that doesn't store the water. Um, but they are seeing snow levels rise, uh, which is not a, not a good thing in the long run. Um, this last summer of 2019, uh, August, traditionally you see monsoons boil up out of the, the Gulf of Mexico and from down south, and they come in and, and afternoon rainstorms replenish water pockets and streams. Uh, this last August, we really didn't have monsoons down there, and that's really worrisome to a lot of the, the climate scientists and the hydrologists, and specifically it worries the, the National Park Service scientists who know how many uh, species are reliant on that water. And we're, we're seeing things, for example, like uh, um, bighorn sheep more down on the river levels now because there's no, uh, there are no streams and water pockets up in some of the side canyons. Um, you know, they have to go to water. So um, there's some species-specific changes happening right now. And I guess in terms of uh, snowpack versus rainfall, it, it's almost a, a give and a take in terms of the Colorado River because um, less rainfall or less snow runoff leads to lower levels at Lake Powell. You get lower levels at Lake Powell, and so you don't have the river, you don't have the lake, the reservoir, backing up the Colorado River, and so you've got a rebirth, if you will, of some of the lower rapids in Cataract Canyon. Right. I did talk to a couple of uh, uh, boatmen in uh, Moab, a guy named Mike DeHoff and uh, Bego Gerhardt and Peter Lefebvre. They've actually created a, a project they call the Emerging Rapids Project. They've watched these changes happen as the lake level in uh, Lake Powell has retreated. Um, you know, in the last 15 years, at one point, Lake Powell was down 150 feet. Uh, Mike DeHoff, as I interviewed him in his welding shop, actually in Moab, because he custom builds dories and, and frames, said, you know, uh, at one point you used to go down through Cataract Canyon and go through the last of the big drops, which are the big rapids. And while you were doing that, you would look down and see jet skis and houseboats uh, at Lake Powell as the, the thing was at full pool. But as it's drained, actually, right now, uh, some of the rapids in the lower part of Cataract Canyon are coming back out slowly um, because the lake level is so, so low. Uh, the main one that they're looking at right now is one called Gypsum Canyon Rapid. Gypsum Canyon and Dark Canyon are two large canyons that drain off the west side of the Abajo Mountains in uh, southeastern Utah. And um, when John Wesley Powell came down through the area in 1869, Gypsum Rapid was considered a very large rapid, and of course it was inundated by Lake Powell when it came up. And now as the lake level is going down, they're starting to see, um, specifically gyp Gypsum Rapid, starting to come back a little bit, and they're, they're actually watching that. They've got some time-lapse cameras on that. If Lake Powell retreats even more, it's very possible we'll see the return of Gypsum Rapid, the entire thing coming up. Now, for for some time now, a number of years, there's been talk that uh, maybe we should just drain Lake Powell and let all the water go down to Lake Mead. Did you run into any of that discussion in, in your interviews? I did. I, I talked to a, a, a professor at Utah State University, Dr. Jack Schmidt, and he's the director of something called the Center for Colorado River Studies up, up there in the Department of Watershed Scientists. He's really one of the premier experts on, on water in the Colorado River uh, basin. He was also acting as a consultant for the Bureau of Reclamation, and their their Bureau of Reclamation is really, like I said, the the overall authority and how water is used and stored and and things through their Colorado River Storage Project. But they are relying on a lot of scientists, a lot of computer scientists, hydrologists, and people like Dr. Schmidt to try and figure out what to do in the future if if less water is coming coming down. And one of Dr. Schmidt's uh, proposals, one of his options. Um, and I know the Bureau of Reclamation is, is possibly looking at this, is to go ahead and um, have Lake Mead fill and use Lake Powell as the, as the storage for the extra, extra water. Um, as I mentioned right now, Bureau of Reclamation tends to operate them both together and keep them both at similar levels. And uh, we'll, we'll see, see what happens uh, with that. The other thing that's going on is that when Glen Canyon Dam was created, um, the estimated flow in the Colorado River was around 17 and a half million acre feet of water per year. 
Um, even back in the 1950s when that dam was being proposed, a couple of the hydrologists that worked for Bureau of Reclamation didn't think those those uh, levels were accurate, and it is more around 12 and a half million acre feet a year right now. So that's quite the quite the deficit uh, as far as how much water is coming down, how much they projected was going to come down, and if it's going to be warmer and drier, it's going to even go down below 12 and a half million feet. Uh, I did talk to a, a, a woman, uh, Taylor Hawes, who's with the Nature Conservancy in Colorado River Project, um, and she just basically said it's it's. Uh, this whole thing's a product of just bad math, is what she said. That there's there was you know, less water projected, and there's really no way that both these reservoirs would be able to fill consistently. So you know it's quite a conundrum right now for Bureau of Reclamation trying to figure out how to fill reservoirs with not enough water and projected with climate change to be less in the future. And certainly that'll add to the tension between the uh, upper and lower basin states over how much water each one of those gets. Oh, absolutely. When it was uh, designated at 17 and a half million acre feet, that's what they figured the water flow was going to be. The, the upper basin and lower basin, um, the dividing line for that is at Lee's Ferry, right below Glens Canyon Dam. And they each were allocated 50% of that, that total. Um, and that's like you know, like we said, it's not it's not anywhere near that. Now downstream, there's 40 million people depending on the the water of the Colorado River, and so this is a this is a huge huge problem. Um, it's a lot of a lot of people, recreation, um, hydropower. They're nice side benefits, but really comes down to water storage. Uh, right now, the entire Colorado River storage project with Flaming Gorge and. Aspinall projects up on the Gunnison River and, and uh, Glen Canyon and things like that. Uh, they and like me, they can store about four four times the amount of water that comes down the Colorado River every year. But with reduced flows, it's going to it's going to be more and more of a challenge to to do that. We're talking today with Patrick Cohn, a freelance photojournalist writer who was um, working on a series of stories for the Traveler about the Colorado River and how its health or lack thereof impacts national parks in Utah. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences that it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. RV Share provides not only an option for renters to enjoy the perks of RV travel without having to buy one, but an opportunity for owners to earn income by renting theirs out. You'll find everything from large and luxurious Class A RVs all the way to small and easy to tow pop-up campers. You can even use their filters to find an RV that is dog friendly or one that will be delivered right to your campground. Visit RVShare.com to start your search for the perfect RV rental or to list your RV. We're back with uh, Patrick Cohn, a writer, freelance journalist who's been working on a series of stories involving the Colorado River and Utah and its impact on um, Glen Canyon National Recreation Area and Canyonlands National Park. Um, One thing we haven't touched on yet, Patrick, which I know you've been working on, is is how invasive species are impacting at least Lake Powell, if not uh, the Colorado River and Canyonlands as well. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, The quagga mussel specifically is now overrun Lake Powell. It it, uh, came in from Ukraine with uh, shipping containers and and ballast and tanks into Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan now has... uh, is basically infested with quagga mussels. They're small, 
um, small little muscles, uh, and somehow got introduced into into Lake Mead in the um, early 2000s and came up into Lake Powell in around 2012. Um, Lake Powell is now considered infested with them, and it definitely affects um, not just uh, operations with, with people with boats, because they'll encrust boats and clog inboard and outboard motors. It also, they also, as the lake goes up and down, the, the shells and the mussels will line the beaches, and people have a hard time walking on on the, the mussel shells with bare feet. But probably one of the, the bigger impacts of the quagga mussel invasives are the operations at Glen Canyon Dam. And uh, they do try and keep their pen stocks and all of their equipment clean of these mussels um, because they'll, they'll impact the, the efficiency of the, the dam. Um, that's just one of the invasives. Obviously, tamarisk is a, a non-native tree that's, uh, that's come up through the entire Colorado River Basin over the last century. A Russian olive is another one that's an issue. Um, also, as the water's warming, uh, more warm, warm water fish species are coming up. Uh, into the river, specifically below Glen Canyon Dam, some things that they've never seen before. Yeah, be prepared for a lot of change. That's what the, the John Spence, the uh, Chief uh, Resource Stewardship and Science at the Glen Canyon National Recreation Area for the National Park Service has said. Things are going to change, change uh, you know, more and more quickly as we, we go along, and, and more and more species are coming in. Um, different kinds of grasses are coming in. Um, you know, to plants and grasses, uh, bird migration patterns are changing. It's it's uh, it's going to happen right before our eyes. I guess another um, issue to be dealt with away from the the pure natural resource issue is the Park Service. Um, as climate change um, stretches out the the main season for visitation and the shoulder seasons shrink as they become part of the main season. Uh, that creates a manpower situation for the Park Service and a funding situation to pay for that manpower. That uh, it'll be interesting to see how the Park Service uh, solves that conundrum. Right, as the, as seasons are extended and the climate is is warmer and and drier than actually tourist seasons extended throughout the year too. Uh, you see more river trips in in late fall, early winter, early spring. You know, things things like that. They they've got their hands full. Trying to figure out how to how to deal with this. The interesting thing about the National Park Service is they really have nothing to do with the flows in the Colorado River. They have no authority over that at all. They they show up in meetings and things like that, but really they are um, powerless to do anything about river flows. Um, they're starting to see things like the constriction of uh, streams uh, before when streams in some of the side canyons would would uh, flow out uh, across the entire stream. Now that they're being narrowed and cottonwoods and willows are coming in, that's affecting the ecosystem and you know, not just fish, but other, other species like the leopard frog and, and things like that. So they're, they're kind of just having to deal with what they're given. Um, and uh, they're coming down through the Green River and the Colorado River drainages. That's because the, the Bureau of Reclamation is in charge of managing the, the river flows. Right, Bureau of Reclamation, and of course they have a lot of partners. Bureau of Reclamation has a lot of uh, people that show up in meetings. Everybody from, from you know, LA Water and Power to uh, the Native tribes, the the Wallapai, the Navajo uh, Nation, the Havasupai, and even all the way down down to the Gulf of Mexico. But the uh, Colorado River flows are they're over allocated, and uh, it's only going to get get worse as far as you know trying to divide a diminishing resource. It's it's going to be a um, uh, management um, issue coming up, and it already is. Well, Patrick, thanks for that sneak peek into your stories, and uh, we'll be anxious to see uh, exactly the whole tale as it is uh, in your words and pictures. All right, well, I'm glad to be here. I hope people enjoy the series. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, a training center, a conference center, and a leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. 
You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles off the Florida Keys, just very well might be the most difficult park to reach in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, scuba diving, fishing, and kayaking. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. There is in northern Minnesota on the Grand Portage Indian Reservation a national monument that reaches back in time. Though the Grand Portage National Monument captures a somewhat small window of history in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, you could say that window of history goes back much further, at least another century. Joining us to understand that history is Stephen Veit from the Monuments Museum staff. Welcome to The Traveler, Steve. Thanks, Kurt. So, in my brief research, um, this area um, on Lake Superior was home of the Ojibwe Indians going back to the 1600s. Yeah, it's uh, Grand Portage is, you know, and, and they would even say that it's a uh, you know, phrase we have sometimes here we hear is uh, there goes back to their homeland is, is time before memory even. Um, and certainly some of the history we've been learning lately tells us that you know, we know this area has been inhabited for many, many years before we talk about the fur trade period here, mostly in the late 18th century. Um, in fact, one of the reasons why Grand Portage National Monument was established, and we're certainly one of the lesser known of the 419 units of the Park Service, but um, our enabling legislation states that we were created for the purpose of preserving an area containing unique historical values. And so that's kind of given us a broad latitude to do research into this period beforehand. And, um, you know, we've discovered that, you know, Certainly there's, you know, copper and stone tool technologies back here, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000 years, uh, at least wow. with the copper, about 7,000 years, certainly. So, and stone tools even further than that. But the, the perhaps the pertinent window of time that the, the monument was established for was, uh, uh, what, 1784 when the Northwest Company showed up? Yeah, correct. And so we've got, yeah, 1784 is the date, 1779 is another one thrown out there for when the, the first inception is, up until about 1802. And that's the, the Northwest Company, which... Uh, for students of the fur trade out there, probably heard of, but most people are more familiar with the rival, the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, but the Northwest Company, uh, during its heyday there in the late 1790s, controlled nearly 80% of the North American fur market by the year 1800. So this was a, a massive business. Um, their enterprise here is using Grand Portage as their inland headquarters. Do we know who um, who is responsible for telling the Northwest Company about this portage? Well, it's uh, it definitely has a has a history certainly before the uh, you know the Scottish shareholders of the, of the company get involved in that the earliest documentation we have is the French being shown the route um, by a Cree guide by the name of Oshiga and of course the Cree the Ojibwe the Sioux and the Assiniboine are all sovereign nations that are within this region um, in that that 18th century period and so they're definitely hearing it from American Indians and then you know kind of um, learning this the path. Uh, you need to think about the Grand Portages, what it gives um, the fur companies the opportunity to do is to get inland. They, uh, particularly with the Northwest Company, they were prohibited from using Hudson's Bay um, because that company has a royal charter going back to 1670 that granted them exclusive access to that watershed. And so anybody else trying to compete in the interior of North America had to find an alternate route. And so the uh, Northwest Companies, um, you know, this is kind of following an earlier French route, if you will, and it was shown to them by the, uh, uh, the local native population. And, of course, that's when the Northwest Company comes in in the 1770s, following on the coattails of the independent British companies, and um, begins their, their massive trade all the way across North America. And their empire was going to span from the Atlantic to the Pacific. 
Now, there recently on Netflix, I believe, was a show called um, Frontier that um, presumably captured the, the fur trade of about that time, I think. Are you familiar with the program? I'm, I've heard the name. I'll confess my ignorance. I've never seen it. I've been told I need to watch part of it. And just from what I've heard, I hear it's, uh, it's got some inaccuracies, as probably would be expected. But uh, I've, I, I'm sorry I haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah. It ran for three seasons, and uh, uh, unfortunately, it uh, was not renewed for a fourth. I'm not sure why. I thought it was quite captivating. Now, um, how significant was uh, this depot that the Northwest Company set up? I mean, yeah, like you said, yeah, we're, we're familiar with the Hudson's Bay Company, but we don't hear that much about the Northwest Company. Were they uh, a larger rival? Yeah, certainly were. Um, and so, you know, again, I've mentioned they're about controlling nearly 80% of the fur market by the year 1800. Um, there'd be about 200 tons of furs and merchandise that would flow through Grand Portage uh, during that late 18th century window, say 1790s, you know, early 1800s. And uh, what makes this place so nationally significant, why we have a designation as a, as a national park unit is because of the, uh, um, it has to be our geographic location or that, that, uh, that, that space, if you will, um, you would allow a, a visitor today, even then certainly in the fur trade era, could paddle a canoe. You could get to Hudson Bay, Gulf mm-hmm. of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, and the Pacific Ocean. And the longest overland walk you'd ever have at one time across the entire North American continent was no more than 12 miles. And so it was uh, just sort of like this central hub that everything would flow through here with waterway access, and that's what allowed the company to use this. Uh, it was also uh, centrally located from uh, the headquarters in Montreal, where the big 40-foot-long birch bark canoes would be bringing trade goods in from, and then there are 120-plus interior trading posts that are scattered across northwestern Canada, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and so forth. And the distance was too great to cover the ground to get from Montreal to those interior posts and back out in one season before freeze-up. And so in the absence of modern communications, telephones, and email, people had to still meet, and they would meet face-to-face to communicate ideas, order trade goods, exchange information, and that meeting spot was Grand Portage. Now, um, going back into the 1700s, maybe earlier, it was referred to as the Great Carrying Place, right? Correct. Yeah, the uh, Ojibwe name is Gitche and Nigaming, and that's what the translation is: Great Carrying Place. And it is uh, again, it's an eight and a half mile uh, portage, you know, a walkway, if you will. And for listeners who aren't familiar with the word portage, it's an overland carry where you have to connect uh, between two bodies of water as far as being able to move a canoe. And it was just such an important hub, and it's all shaped by the geography and the geology of the area that modern maps really can't improve on, on, on the route. And so where we are is right along the bay, and uh, it's called Grand Portage Bay. We're about six miles south of the Canadian border as far as the Highway 61 is concerned. But the portage arcs kind of northwest and bypasses the last 21 miles of falls and rapids along the Pigeon River. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the Pigeon River culminates up there at the Grand Portage State Park, which is our highest waterfalls in the state of Minnesota. And so you're bypassing that as well as... Uh, several other rapids and, and chutes and so forth. And it was easier to take one long portage than several short ones that you still have to unload the canoe and get everything out of. Yeah. Were, were the fur traders pretty good uh, canoeists um, at the time? Or, you know, I understand the Ojibwe were, you know, not only great paddlers, but, you know, they had great skills in terms of building canoes. Did they, did they share that with the fur traders or were the fur traders already pretty adept in overwater travel? Uh, I'd say it's both. Uh, and so certainly the birch bark canoe is an indigenous invention here in North America. Um, and in Grand Portage, we have birch trees, we have white cedar, we have black spruce, which are the, the trees that you're going to need to be building these. We know that the Northwest Company has orders in with the local community here to have canoes provided. Um, and so you'd be oftentimes finding the smaller 24 to 27 foot long canoes being built by uh, the Ojibwe people here, and then the larger canoes are being built at factories near Montreal, uh, the big 36-footers, which are kind of the analogous to the semi-trucks of that period. And so both parties are building them. But the, uh, the story kind of goes with Jacques Cartier coming down the St. Lawrence River Valley in the 1530s. He's traveling in these rowboats or these bateaux, and they're rowing backwards mm-hmm. and you know, being able to see uh, uh, Mi'kmaq Indians come right by in you know, canoes, paddling forward, mm-hmm. facing forward, and so forth, and, and getting the idea that way. Yeah. Now, of course, it's it's February when we're talking, and it's a cold, snowy month. And while you might not be seeing many visitors at the National Monument, um, going back in history, winter was a pretty busy time there, wasn't it? Well, absolutely. That's the time of year that the trapping is going to go on. The uh, animals have their, their thickest pelts, so we think of us you know, putting on our heavy winter coats and so forth. We want to be warm, and 
the animals uh, you know, certainly develop a, a thicker hide, and that was the time of year that the, the fur was considered to be the most desirable. And so uh, folks wouldn't be congregated here along the, uh, the, uh, the bay, You'd move further inland for, for trapping and so forth. Um, now, here in Grand Portage, historically, it was still pretty quiet. Uh, only about six to ten people would have been occupying this space uh, you know, in, during, the, uh, during the winter, but there's always activity going on as far as uh, the trapping. And, you know, that trade's going to happen all winter long as well. When, when would they hold the rendezvous at the, the portage? So the rendezvous would have been uh, traditionally held probably around, we figure, uh, late June into early July. Uh, for us, we do a reenactment of it the second weekend of August, and we'll always tell people that's probably the last possible day you could be in Grand Portage and still make it back to your destination before freeze-up. But during that uh, the summer month, that uh, you know, three- or four-week window in, in late June, early July, you'd have about 1,200 people assembled here in Grand Portage. And wow. those would mostly be French-Canadian voyagers. Uh, of course, the company shareholders are here. Uh, the local Ojibwe population uh, is uh, obviously here and so forth. And there's this big exchange of the trade goods coming in from Montreal. So items like English wool blankets and Irish linens, Chinese silks, India cottons, and French brass kettles, Brazilian tobacco, ostrich plumes from Morocco, goods from all over the world coming through. And at the same time, the furs that the sovereign tribes across North America gathered, those would be traded in the winter at the interior posts, and then those furs were paddled down here by the voyagers, and smaller canoes and that exchange takes place over the Grand Portage Trail. So the trade goods come up the trail, and the furs go down, and everything gets reset. So those big 40-foot canoes that bring in trade goods now take furs back at the end of the rendezvous as they head to Montreal, and the trade goods go back into the interior to restart that trading cycle all over again. Yeah. Now we, we hear um, out in the West, uh, the fur trappers and the rendezvous they would hold in the 1800s um, were, were kind of rowdy times. Um, was the rendezvous at uh, Grand Portage similar to that or were they a more business-like approach? Uh, I would say it's probably, again, that's a pretty fair assessment. Um, you know, they're just to differentiate between the Rocky Mountain fur trade and the Great Lakes fur trade, they are kind of apples and oranges in so many ways uh, as, as to what would be taking place and that uh, who's garnering the furs and so forth. But, yeah, definitely it was a, a busy time for the, um, the company and, and particularly Voyagers coming down. Uh, this is the chance that you're going to see some family members, some friends, folks you haven't seen in 11 months uh, since the uh, event on the prior year. Mm -hmm. And so it was, a, you know, an opportunity to really look forward to. And there's a, a quote in one of the journals about, you know, anybody that can afford the, to, to leave the interior country should do it uh, just because it's, uh, you, you want to have that, that, that social outing, that gathering, and, and definitely could be. Um, so visitors that come to our site today, they'll see a, um, a theater palisade, you know, pickets that in, in, they encase all the way around a, uh, the buildings inside. And it gives the impression that some sort of military fortification or stockade of some sort. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you kind of look at the, uh, the, the high ground around it in the bay, you realize pretty quickly that you couldn't pick, you know, really a, a less intelligent spot to, to build a, a, a fort of some sort. But why that palisade wall is there, it's to kind of keep some of that rowdiness down. Uh -huh. um, the gates were open to allow the indigenous people in to trade, but you're keeping out the, uh, the voyagers. And you've even got some class and cultural differences with the English-speaking Protestants and the partners and the company businessmen, the French-speaking Catholics with the voyagers. And, but largely it was uh, the 16 buildings inside, the, uh, inside that compound. You don't have a whole lot of room to put 1,200 people and so yeah. the Voyagers camped on the outside, and that Palisade wall was kind of more just like a chain-link fence, if you will, for traffic control and so forth. But yeah, it definitely <laughs> could get rowdy. Yeah, yeah. So what can visitors see, to, see at the monument, uh, both uh, now during the winter months and uh, during the summer? Well, sure. It's, uh, you know, winter, like you say, is, is definitely slower, and we're probably not unique in, in several parks in that regard. But uh, we love having folks any time of year they can come. And the great thing about visiting now is you kind of get the place to yourself in a way. A busy day for us might be just 50 or 60 people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, we have a, a great park film. Uh, we still call it new. It was redone, I think, in 2011 when we started showing it now. But it's, uh, it's told from the perspective of a Native woman here in Grand Portage. And it just really does a great job capturing the feel of the fur trade, the experience. It was all filmed locally here in the county. Um, several community members actually uh, uh, helping us out as actors in the in, in the production, and a lot of our, um, our reenactors from the rendezvous were in it. And it's just a great time to see that. We also have uh, the bonus features, or we call them the shorts, which is kind of a, a little bit of behind the scenes, what life looks like in the community in Grand Portage today, interviews with folks growing up in Grand Portage, um, uh, interactions with the uh, 
the ecology of, of the area, if you will, as far as like using prescribed burns for blueberry production and so forth. So it's, it's a, a, a greater part of the story than just the fur trade that we can kind of tell this time of year. Uh, we have snowshoes for uh, visitors to, uh, to pick up, essentially, if you will, and, and try out. We don't charge a fee for anything like that. We just want to see some ID, but folks can come in and take their, take their shot at some snowshoes if they want to do that. Are they birch, uh, birch snowshoes? Or, uh, uh, more, I believe more... they are, yeah. Oh. So look at the, the, the old style ones. And we also, of course, have our exhibit gallery that's open. We've got, uh, being a museum professional, I kind of want to throw a plug out for the National Park Service Museum Program. We've got over 48 million objects that the, the museum cares for and over 136 million archives. Um, at Grand Portage, we have a, a much smaller amount, obviously, than that. We're about 90,000 <laughs> 90, um, uh, archaeological objects. We've got about 400 on display, and uh, visitors are encouraged to go and see that because so much of our story here at Grand Portage we're able to tell as a result of our museum collection. We have very little written in the way of primary documentation about this place. And so uh, what we have are these tangible links to the past that help us to uh, really convey that story. And so visitors can, you know, open up a drawer and see the exact, you know, hardware that would have been on a building at the time. And so then going over to the depot come summertime, you'll see a reproduction of that, that building hardware, that paint they used on the doors and the windows, a canoe paddle, anything like that. So all of those items on display have their archaeological counterparts here in our museum. And much of that is available for visitors to see all year. Now, when folks um, hear Grand, Grand Portage mentioned and they, they think about the fur trade and the canoeing up and down uh, um, the lakes and the rivers there, one thing they might not immediately think about are the, the gardens that you guys have there. Sure. Um, and so we've got a, a couple of gardens. We've got a heirloom European garden and then a traditional three sisters garden. And one of the interesting things about Grand Portage we know of in the the inventory we have surviving from 1797 is that a packet of garden seeds uh, shows up on that. We don't know what the contents were, unfortunately, but we do know from other company records that gardens were involved in the interior and seeds would have passed through here. But yeah, we have an heirloom gardening program that um, in that Three Sisters Garden, we're growing uh, corn, squash, and beans. And that was you know, grown traditionally throughout North America and the, the southern tip of South America, anywhere you have a, a growing season long enough to sustain that. And uh, it was it's, uh, very traditional with, with all the different uh, sovereign nations and so forth that are, that are uh, going to be growing these, these crops. And then these are items that were used for exchange as well. Uh, of course, corn was used to, to feed the voyagers on the, the second half of their journey from Michelin-Mackinac over to, to, to Grand Portage. And then from what we know about here with the gardens in Grand Portage, some of the stuff we've been able to grow are um, potatoes, which would have been considered animal fodder there in the, the late 18th century, certainly. But um, mm-hmm radishes, carrots, onions, and so forth. So, yeah, we've uh, got a, 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 a great gardening program here that uh, the, the staff works real hard on. Yeah. yeah. And what about the, the portage, the, the eight-and-a-half or nine-mile-long portage? Um, do many people go out to check it out or, or paddle it? Well, yeah, it's, uh, it's sort of the, the finishing spot for a lot of folks coming out of the Boundary Waters. So we have that connection with the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness and the, uh, the whole Quetico Superior Complex, if you will, and for our visitors, though, we'd love to encourage and get more people out there. That's really the reason why we are here as a national park is to preserve that trail. So many of our visitors are familiar with the depot and the buildings, and, and it's a great story that we tell, but we'd love to get more visitors out there to see it. And even going at this time of year on snowshoe or cross-country skis is a great way to see the trail. The vegetation's obviously down. You can see some more of the cliffs and the vistas. It's a beautiful walk in the fall. It's a a beautiful walk in the summer if you uh, don't mind a couple of mosquitoes now and then. Uh, but certainly, yeah, the portage is, is open year-round for folks to use. And, again, that's, that's why we're here. It's um, one of the most significant trails that we, we could say we have in North America as far as uh, uh, the importance, certainly when it comes to trade. So, uh, yeah, we definitely want to encourage people to, to get out there and see it. Yeah. And for listeners who are um, curious about the, the portage and, and what it's like, um, if you visit nationalparkstraveler.org, um, we're, we will post a story that um, we ran several years ago. Um, one of our contributors and some friends actually did the, uh, the Voyagers to Grand Portage um, canoe trip in October, which uh, to me sounds like the perfect time of year to go. It really, you know, it really is October. <laughs> I was going to say September and October are kind of the optimal times of year to walk the trail. But uh, again, you can you can go anytime. We do a, a breeding bird survey out there in June, and if you're you like to listen to the birds sing, it's it's a great time of year to go. Again, you'll want a mosquito head net and some uh, some dry boots certainly. But uh, yeah, really any time of year is a, a great time to do it. But definitely the fall is probably uh, the most optimal. 
Yeah. We've been talking with Stephen Veit of the uh, museum staff at Grand Portage National Monument in Minnesota, taking a quick look at this in- interesting national monument and what it preserves. Stephen, thanks so much for joining us today and for the rundown on the monument, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, have to make a trip up there and uh, do some paddling. Well, thanks, Kurt. I appreciate what you're doing to publicize the National Park System and uh, taking the time to highlight us here in Grand Portage National Monument. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Your support of the traveler is more important than ever. A recent study by the Pew Research Center found that U.S. newspaper circulation fell in 2018 to its lowest level since 1940. Between 2008 and 2018, advertising revenues for news organizations fell 62%. While 71% of the respondents contacted by Pew thought their local news outlet was well off financially, only 14% said they actually paid for local news. National Parks Traveler, a 501c3 nonprofit media organization, is the only media organization focused entirely on covering national parks and protected areas. We are striving to pick up the slack from news organizations that have gone dark. Traveler relies on its readers and listeners for support. Please visit nationalparkstraveler.org today and make a donation to support our efforts to keep you informed about national parks and protected areas. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Park's Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.